Kitchen. Got my brown veil up here still. It's time! It's my terrible Bruce Buffer. Oh, you stirred up your coffee. Good. Yeah, you like it foamy? Like it all frothy? I like it frothy. You do. You would, you bougie bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no hat? You wanted the hat? Oh, I know. Yeah, next podcast. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. Let's pop it then. Yep. You might want to suck on that. You shook it up like crazy. <laughs> I think you're accentuating the sound effects on purpose. I'm mm. pretty sure. <laughs> mm. We had a premature release there. I hear that happens for some men. <laughs> Not something I've experienced yet, but, you know. Fingers crossed. Knock on some wood. <laughs> Back in the cave. So what are we starting with? Are we starting with your fancy pants story? Oh, sure. <laughs> the world's nicest pants that I found? Yeah, do tell. I am a, I'm a connoisseur of pants. Yeah. I, and, and one thing I want to know from our audience is what the best hunting pants are. The best hunting pants that you can get in a solid. Because I, every time I, I've been looking for a long time and I mm -hmm. find something... And like seams rip or they don't fit right or the pockets are in weird places. Mm -hmm. I still think, I think there's room for somebody to make the world's best hunting pants. I'm actually uh, optimistic someday if I ever get big enough that somebody that has a, uh, a hunting clothes company or whatnot would actually let me design a pant. Because I'd change a bunch of crap personally. Yeah, I think, anyway... Like the pants I wear a lot that people always ask what pants those are. They're modified mm -hmm. pants from Eddie Bauer because mm -hmm. like, it actually has the features that I want it to have. And I, I just freaking wish somebody would let me. I've Top talked to a couple of them trying to get them to, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> Top pin challenge. I didn't want to get sunburned, so I just ran down to Dick's Sporting Goods. I'm looking for like the lightest pants I could find that will cover me up. And I didn't really find anything, and I got to the very far back corner of Dick's. I was like, oh, those look nice. What are those? Patagonia. I never buy Patagonia stuff. Let me um, let me try them on. And they're awesome, dude. They're like the lightest pants I've ever worn. And if I can wear something to work that doubles as something I can go like work out in or jog in or mm -hmm. it just it removes friction from my day, you know, sure. like not having to have an extra set of shorts to go work out in or that kind of thing. So, yeah, these little Patagonia lounger pants – Dude, they're money. They're Patagonia Terraforms. I even know the name because I went and bought like three or four more pairs. How much were they? Nine 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 nine. A hundred dollars for a pair of comfy pants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were commenting prior before we turned this camera yeah. on that I was like, Tim's a bougie bitch. <laughs> He's always got some fancy freaking yeah. Lulu Lemon. But when you don't pants. buy stuff, dude, <laughs> I don't buy stuff. So. Well, yeah, dude, I wear the same pants and shorts all the time. Yeah. But that's. I guess I can't complain too much. I mean, I think my the pants that I wear a lot are like 55, 60 bucks. Yeah. It's not that far off. No. There so. was a time in my like mid 20s, I was in like a gear accumulation phase. Mm -hmm. And every time I had extra money, I'd spend it on gear. And I'm like, do I actually have spending problems or do I actually need this gear? I think you might moderately have spending I problems. I might have then. <laughs> um, but since I've accumulated the gear I've wanted, I haven't done any of that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part. Other than the only thing I need right now is a spotting scope. Well, I got a couple, remember? Yeah, I know. You're talking about it. I was trying to help you out. But I have Give all... you good financial <laughs> advice. I have all the gear I want for hunting, except I need a good freaking spotting scope. Well, do you need an okay spotting scope or a good spotting scope or and, a great spotting scope? I mean, you know how it is with glass. Like, I know if you're cutting a corner anywhere, you're being an idiot. Yeah. Just buy the nicest thing you can get your hands on. Yeah. I know it sucks. I know it's expensive. I know it costs a lot, but you're never going to lose money on a good pair of optics. It's a buy once, cry once kind of deal. And I, I feel that because, you know, I love cameras. And when you buy a good good lens, dude, it lasts forever. Are you looking for something packable, ideally? Or do you want something bigger by uh, that it would stay near equipment so you weren't carrying it? I think anything? I got to be able to pack it. 
So yeah. Sproul's got the new, really small, low-profile rubber-armored one. We still haven't gotten one in yet, but I should be getting them real quick. Mm -hmm. um, that one's real intriguing, uh, and I don't. We we got. I take that back. We got one in orange that was angled, and it sold in like a day. And that's the only yeah. one we've seen. Now, you're a straight spotting scope guy, right? I am a straight spotting scope guy. I'm very a, much. I'm an angled spotting scope kind of guy. Give your argument. We got to hear it. Okay. Well, it's hard to if you're. There's a couple things. It all one, depends on your use case, straight, right? It, it, it's what you're using it for, for sure. I have angled and straight, and I almost never use the angled ones. Mm -hmm. uh, largely because when you're trying to find the object, it's easier to be able to look outside of the spotting scope and point it straight. And when you have an angled eyepiece, that's very hard to do. I think everyone will agree with you on that. Yeah, so you that, can just line it up and knock it down. It's way kind of easier to find. Yep. You're going to find what you're looking for quicker, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, it is typically clearer. It really is, and it's clearer because of the way the lenses work. It's a straighter line, mm. so you typically do get slightly clear, slightly better clarity. I've never but heard it's, that. it's you'd have a hard time seeing it. But it yeah. is it is functionally yeah. easier to do straight. It's easier to pack straight because it's narrower when you try to pack it, put it in your pack, right? And outside of that, um, head strain. So you, if you have a good spotting scope and a good tripod, you should be able to set it up to where, in an ideal world, you're sitting in a chair comfortably. With your head like this. So now, you're not going to hear me very well because I'm going to move my head away from this, but with an angled one, you're like this. What happens when you stare at your phone all day? Does your neck hurt? Yeah. yeah. When, I, when I think about my hunting experience to date, I haven't spent like a day on the glass. You know, it's usually yeah. AM, PM kind of thing. But yeah. I see that. I, I hear that. If you're going to spend all day glassing, mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense to me. There's a good chance on the hunt you're about to do, you're going to spend a lot of time glassing. Um, That's all it's going to be. It's going to be peeling back glass. And the what an, what an angled eyepiece is for, it's for one thing. It's what it's designed for, is to be able to sit on a bench, shoot your rifle, and turn your head this way and look through your spotting scope. Or stand here and shoot your bow, and then turn your head this way and look through your spotting scope. That's pointed over there. That's what an angled eyepiece is for. And it's better for looking uphill. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, better for Barely. looking. Barely. Well, it just depends. You're still looking down. Downhill? You're, Tim, you're still doing this to look through it. You're moving your head like that. Yeah, That's not good bit. for your neck. A little bit. I hear that. If you do it for long periods of time, like um, a dual is way better for you functionally. Like if it has two, like the big, the big super yeah. bougie swirl. Yeah. Where it's interchangeable or it's two eyes, yeah. you'll get eye fatigue. Even even with a three thousand dollar or four thousand dollar Swarov spotting scope that's single eye, you will get eye fatigue. You absolutely will. Have you seen any of those big uh, binos that have the doubles that are like eighteens or yeah. something yeah, crazy? Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, I know Dan had a Evans had a I can't remember what brand it was, but it was ridiculously expensive, and they were like astronomy binoculars or whatnot. And he had them on a tripod, and that's what he used a lot because you could look through both eyes. Mm -hmm. But Suaro came out with that spotting scope that has two eyepieces on it, and I think that's what I'm going to get. I've been really impressed with Suaro's glass just from what I've I've used from the shops so far. There, there's not better glass. There's just not. I mean, I've I've fought for other stuff. Like I I went to Leica when um, Suaro didn't make a range finding binocular because I wanted an all in one solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've been very happy with Leica over the years that I've had. I've, I've been very pleased. I had their spotting scopes, and they were pretty good. Uh, I was pretty pleased with them. And then I ended up, long story short, actually, ironically, Jared Lyle was who got me hooked up with it. I got on a, a sponsorship program with uh, Nikon at the time, and Nikon wasn't super well known for making the best glass. It was nice medium to high grade. You could probably compare it to a Vortex at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but they just released a series called EDG, and it was the first time I looked through something that I would call comparable. And their spotting scope series, EDG, had the biggest eyepieces I've ever seen on a spotting scope. So the, the ocular end that you looked through was simply larger, and, dude, the clarity was unbelievable. My cousin had a Swaro HD at the time, and we went over to his house and sat on his back porch and glassed the mountain ranges that are, you can see from his back door. Um, and we were picking stuff out with my, uh, with my Nikon easier than his Swaro. And he sold his Swaro and took my Nikon and said, go find another one. <laughs> and he still has it and still swears it's the clearest thing. And I, I, he looks through glass like every evening. This is Nick? No, 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 no. My cousin, Justice. Oh. Yeah, he looks through spotters like every evening in the summer to the fall. He's always looking at the mountains every night before it gets dark, half hour to an hour every day. And they're really good. They don't make them anymore. 
um, they just never took. You know, it was a very expensive optic to make that I, that I don't think they had the name to gain the traction, like Swaro Wood or Leica Wood or even Zeiss. You know, they're names that are synonymous of excessively high quality optics, and uh, and so that's what I've had forever, and I still have three of them actually. I have two full size ones, and then I have a, more of a compact that's in, got an angled eyepiece. Um, and that's what I would use the angled for was like sitting on a bench, turn your head that way so you can look at the target and then put your head back into the scope or standing at like the hundred yard bail, set up a tripod right next to you to where it doesn't obstruct your ability to shoot. And then when you fire, you turn your head and look through the spotting scope and you can see the target. So you know where you hit more accurately. That's what they're for, in my opinion. And most people who design optics would agree with me, I think, but who knows? Uh, but you can't beat a swirl. You just can't. And the funny thing is they just keep getting more expensive. So every year, the price of a Swarovski just gets higher. I've had four pairs, and every one of them is worth more now used than I bought for it. That's cool. It's pretty rare you can say that. Yeah, there's very few things in this world you can buy and actually end up better off in the long run financially that you're going to play with. So to me, a swirl is a no-brainer. Like just pick the size and dimension that you want and stop being cheap and just buy it. Because really, that's the way to go. And they are on the website, by the way, if you're into uh, high-end optics. I felt that that was the best brand, so we decided to carry that and put them on the website. And we've, we've probably sold six pairs or so, so far, I which isn't things, great. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't recognize that you would sell being Podium Archer is uh, <clears throat> Stone Glacier now mm -hmm. and Swirl. Yep. Well, every archer needs layers. I know. I, I know. And every archer it's owns addition, binoculars, but, right? You know, I bet you if you polled 100 people, most people wouldn't think that you had got that stuff yet. So it's going to be a little bit of an awareness thing. It'll take a while for people to realize that we carry it. But if we're diligent and we keep working at it, it'll get there. Mm -hmm. you know, and eventually start, you know, probably putting out videos reviewing things that aren't just archery stuff. What, do you, what other uh, sort of stuff that's an adjacency to archery would you carry that most people wouldn't think about? Uh, they probably wouldn't think that I carry dehydrated food. Yeah, that's true. I carry calls. Um, calls are probably more common to think yeah. that you would. Um, and are you think. selling the dehydrated food on the website? Yeah, that's on yeah. the website. We carry Peak. Um, I think they really make the best overall one. They've been pretty good there. as far as quality versus mm -hmm. quantity versus balance. Mm -hmm. There's a couple other ones, but yeah, Peak's okay. For well, sure. And Stone Glacier is really broad. I mean, it's not just clothes. They have sleeping bags. They have tents. Yeah. They have quite a variety of stuff, and we carry Western most of system, it. Western system, basically. West, yeah, Western system. I um, like them, dude. And they're making yeah. solids, which I think every yeah. hunting company should do. How yeah. much easier is it to buy something you can also wear to work? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I've st I brought in game bags at one point, and they didn't go very well. But I'll bring them, I'll bring them back in. I think it was caribou game bags that we were carrying. Um, I'll it's just such a niche. It's such it a is. commoditized thing. It seems like everybody has a game bag. It is. Know? Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of you know private labeled ones. Yeah. Like, very common. Um, I'm gonna look into water filtration and carry that kind of stuff. Just stuff guys would typically have. You know, if you if you need it for what you're doing, I think it's probably logical for me to carry carry crispy boots. Um, have carried those since Crispy was distributed through um, Black Ovis originally, and I think they separated now. But um, that's once they got brought back in. I carried them for a little while, and then they lost their distributorship in the United States, and then that's where they're coming through now. So I uh, I carry those. Um, I'm trying to think of what else random stuff that wouldn't normally be super common. I, I think mean, you covered it pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. There's other stuff I want to add though. I wanted to. I want to. Uh, I want to look at that direction more. I want to. I want to uh, check out some Stone Glacier stuff again because I used it like many, many moons ago, and I just had like one pant, and this was like the one for Stone Glacier stuff like six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. I got one of their originals, like Sky Archer sixty two hundred packs or something. Mm -hmm. I still have it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a cool brand for sure. Yeah. Uh, oh, we carry um, we carry some bino harnesses. Mm -hmm. I carry binos. Um, we do carry well, one rangefinder. I carry the uh, the Bushnell broadhead because I think it's the best functioning yeah. archery rangefinder. Just rangefinder only. That's another well, one that might not. Trigger. You're gonna do a bomb run down attack tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What? Why? 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 Leaving it, leaving it four. Oh, actually, I'm I'm meeting Bob and Cordelaine at four in the morning, so it, I got to leave here at like three thirty. It wasn't on the calendar, and then you made it. You made it happen. So why'd that come to be? Well. 
we're, I was going to try to go through at least a couple more tournaments. One of them was going to be top pin, which I screwed up my scheduling and couldn't do that. But the reaction I got from going to um, Big Sky was so good that I was like, how do you not do it? If you think you can get to it, how do you not go and and intermingle with those people and communicate with those people? I mean, it just... Well, I think this is the largest attended one, right? It is. It's 5,000 people. Dude, it's going to be wild. That is going to be wild. And I, I'm worried I'm going to lose my voice before the weekend's <laughs> over instead of losing my voice at the end of it. Yeah. Um, we'll see how that goes. But um, it's it was literally just because of the response. And I went, man, I just I, I need to get out there with those people more often and in a bigger scale would be great. So I'm excited. Um, I'm hoping I don't run myself into the ground for driving that all in one day. But um, And I think probably about halfway through, Bob and I will swap. And Bob will drive the second half because um, it's like 11 hours or 11 and a half hours or something like that, and you lose an hour going. So if you want to get there with some daylight enough to maybe check a couple marks before you have to shoot, because our shoot time is 6 a.m., um, the next probably day. Probably be at seven, eight thousand feet, huh? I haven't looked. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably around there. It'll be at least that because the valley. Uh, it's in Park City, right? Uh, it's outside of Park City, so you go out of Park City and go. Up yeah, so the there, valley so. of Park City is like sixty five hundred. Oh, okay. And then as you get into the hills, it progresses, but you'll probably be at like eight thousand, something like that. Yeah, it's Solitude Mountain. Yeah, or something like that. Mm-hmm. So well, I, don't, I don't know. We'll find out. We'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. I know how far off I was at uh, Big Sky, so I've got a pretty good idea. It'll be similar. Yeah. Did, you, yeah. did you save your marks? Oh, yeah. I have them saved in my phone. It's going to be the same. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's probably what i Unless air to. density is different or, you know, something different's going on, but you'll be very close, I bet. Yeah. It's an elevation thing, for sure. hmm Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I just felt like there was such great response from that that I kind of had to. I feel obligated to take those opportunities when there's large groups of people that would have interest in what we're doing to uh, be able to communicate with them and spend time with them. Hang out. Yeah, I will probably, I know we're going to do Maybe early days, beers? both days. <laughs> Maybe, we'll see. I don't, I, I'm not going to do much because yeah. I, I need to, I need to try to save my, I, I'd stayed up way too late both times. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that contributed to it because when you're staying up late, you're talking. It's part of the tack challenge. It is, it is, but I can't talk till midnight or one o'clock in the morning and then go the next day and talk all day long till one o'clock in the morning again. I'll lose my voice. And I don't want to do that. I want to, I, I don't mind if it's gone by the time it's over, but I don't want to lose it while I'm still there. Mm-hmm. And that's what concerns me. So, um, so when does, try uh, to be diligent. When does uh, MFJJ's Broadhead Tuning Masterclass come out? Broadhead Tuning Masterclass? Yeah. <laughs> when I start shooting broadheads. <laughs> I still got to uh, pick my bow. I haven't done that yet. I'm hoping to do that next week because it's going to be a lot of filming. And uh, I think uh, Forrest is around all week, so I can probably take a couple hours a day and do a whole bunch of filming of the shooting of determining those bows because I got to get that done um, and make sure they all fit me the same so I'm being fair. And then once I do get the bow decided on, then I will do the broadhead tuning stuff and cover all the all the bases of what to do and how to do. Um I was going to do a basic aero building video too, because I don't think I've ever done one. Yeah, you should. You know, it's like this, here's the tools that you need. Yeah. Kind of like I'm doing the, the wheel lean videos. It's like, these are the tools that you need. These are the parts that you need to be able to do this task. And here's how the task goes. Um, so yeah, I, I need to get on that too. There's so many I got to do and just, ugh. but fortunately I need to pre-make at least 12 to 15 more than I need currently so by the time September rolls around, I'm not trying to make a video. I can be gone hunting and helping at the shop and whatnot when I'm not hunting. Yeah, sometimes with those things, I get a little discouraged because it's like, well, how many arrow building videos can we put on the internet? You sure. know what I mean? But one, it's yours, right? So it's yeah. your choice of how you want to build it. So it's your flavor. Mm-hmm. And then, dude, you could make one every year because things change, tastes evolve. You well, know, sure, and they, kind of uh, if you make one that's old, it's harder to come up, you know, so the likelihood of people seeing it's less. Mm-hmm. So if you release something new and it takes, it, it'll, it'll be good, mm-hmm. you know. So that's uh, that'll definitely – I was going to try to do it this week, but I did a, a wheeling video with Hoyts uh, yesterday and uh, uh, how to reserve your center serving. Which is a shim system, right? Yeah, it's a spacer shim system. Yeah. You know, if you pull the axle out, everything falls. 
So we covered that and how much it moved, and it moved a lot. Like each spacer was a big difference. Uh-huh. They weren't fine at all, and it really felt like too much movement per spacer to me by a long shot. Like it needed to be half as much. Um, so you know, but that's just the system that they make. Uh-huh. I, I'd like to see improvement every year, and I think they actually added one set of spacers this year from where they were last year, so there was more options. Uh-huh. Um, but I think they need to like double their options, even though it's still. And I'm sure they just looked at Matthews and said, how many does Matthews offer in their top hat system? And we're copying that. But the top, the top hat system, when I adjusted it, it seemed to move half as much every spacer. And Hoyts was moving like double it. So, so far I've aggressive. done, yeah. So I've done three of them now. I've done the current Hoyt, current Matthews, and the current Bowtech. I'll do PSE. Uh, I've got a PSE bow build video to do for that challenge because the bow finally showed up. It just got here. Um, so I'll do that early next week and then I'll do the shoot down and later in the week and determine what bow I'm going to use for uh, for hunting this year. And next year please make me do that before January. <laughs> yeah. Just when it's all out just if I if you haven't seen me start putting those things out just slap me in the face. Cuz I I really need to have those things done early so people can utilize that information early, but it always ends up taking so long and Anytime when you're building an entire bow start to finish, you know, it, it adds an hour to two hours to what it takes to actually build it. Um, but I'm really optimistic, like really optimistic with our growth and the way things are going that when it rolls around to that time of year, ne- this this fall after hunt- after early season, I will be able to spend 30 to 35 hours a week doing just this kind of stuff. Dang. And that'll be easy. Then it'll be, well, I'll, I'll still have like a 70 hour work week, but half of it will be spent doing this. Mm-hmm. And that should make getting as many videos as I possibly feel I can put out, out. Although I have really come to realize that your philosophy on just releasing one good one a week definitely gets you a lot more views on that video. Because as soon as you release a new video, the video that was doing well just stops. At least it seems like it. Every time I've released a new video after I've had like a really good hitting video, that good hitting video is almost non-existent. Would you agree with that? Oh, there's a lot of strategies to success. I, I think you should you should do what you can sustain at the level of quality you're comfortable with. Because um, there are some people who still publish four or five, six days a week, and you know it's got to be more raw. Typically, mm-hmm. you know, there's not like big teams doing that kind of stuff, so. And that can work because you're showing up often, which is a strategy that works on social media. So it all depends on what you can put into it. Yeah. You know, I, there's no right answer, although relatively proven method, you know, once a week ish. Yeah, it, it would be glorious and awesome to just make once one a week because mm-hmm. it would be a lot easier. And you can put your energy and effort into it. And but I have I have so much information to put out. I don't know how to do it otherwise. I really don't. I think I don't think I have a choice. I think I have to sacrifice the um, the growth for getting a lot of information out because I just there's there's just so much. Every time I sit down to think of okay, what should I do next? There's seven new ideas, and I'm like, Jesus, that's so like a week and a half worth of videos if I'm doing five days a week, which I'm not going to do. No matter what, I'll never do seven days a week. I I think people should be outside playing with their gear and spending time with their family on the weekend. So I'm not releasing videos on the weekend. Just not gonna. I'll do it if best is Monday through Friday. I'm doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday right now. Yeah, a couple, two, three a week's pretty solid. Yeah, it's not gonna be enough though, especially when new product starts coming out. Like if you go back and look at my new product videos, there's like 40 bows or 35 bows tested total, or something like that. It's a lot. I mean, that's a month and a half of every day. <laughs> it's a lot, dude. Right. So I, I just when they come out, I just gotta drop them when they come. Well, out. Well, I'm thinking about. Selecting a broadhead. Yeah. I'm thinking about broadhead tuning. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all got to be done. Yeah. Soon. soon. Really soon. Yeah. Soon. Uh, like, I have to have stuff settled in a week, week and a half, period, um, and done. I had a, I had my machinist make me a lighter titanium insert for a 204, shorter one, because I want to make a really light setup. Closer to the less outsert? Yeah, no, no, it's the same, same front cert. Front cert, yeah. Less length okay. for like lighter, lighter duty lighter animals. Builds. Yeah, for like lighter builds. I had a couple of people request. I it. don't even think it needs to be lighter duty animals, dude. Because I really, I think for shooting animals, I think inserts you don't need them. 
like not much of one. Uh, I haven't seen many arrows go through an animal. It's rocks, it's trees, mm -hmm. it's all that other stuff that really bends them up. And you might get a little bend or whatever from hitting bone, but a little insert's enough to really sturdy it up, dude. So I don't think you're, yeah. Yeah, it's it's more the the weight and FOC I like um, to get to that, and I'm still going to target so that. First titanium was 50. First titanium is 50. This one is going to be 25 to 30 grains. That's sweet. Same, air, same insert, just shorter. Um, getting it down as light as you can get it, and then I'll um, I'm still going to target fifteen f fifteen percent FOC. I'm just seeing how light of an arrow I can make, and I'll probably shoot it for antelope. Be my distance bow. Um, yeah, just to just to prove a point, like it's not arrow weight, like it's really not. I mean, it is, but it's not. As long as you're still maintaining a given level of FOC and the appropriate spine. And by taking some weight out of the point, I can shoot a little bit lighter spine arrow, which weighs less. So I still think the majority of what I'd do, I'd still run a similar overall setup. I'd still want at least 150 grains in the front and mm -hmm. work out a 15% equation around that. But for this one, I'm going to push it. <laughs> ah, it's push it. Bad scientist. Well, I like to dabble. It's fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I can get something that actually shoots good, it, uh, it'll be nice. So, yeah, everything will be the lightest thing I can possibly function with and still be accurate with, and we'll see if it works out. I'll be shocked if it doesn't, but I have backup stuff that I, I still have my my setups from last year as far as arrows are concerned, and I know those worked well at the poundages I shot them at, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try something a little lighter, just a little bit. Do I need to be thinking about any other broadheads that – Anything new on the radar for the broadhead scene? We've talked a little bit about it in the last podcast, but... Uh, it just depends on what you want it to do. Um, if you're, like, hunting muleys, muleys aren't, to me, aren't that hard to penetrate. Their skin's still pretty thin, and it's not that big of an animal, so kind of the world's your oyster. I wouldn't probably restrict yep. you at all if you're... Exactly. As far as advice is concerned, um, that, that carnivore is very popular if you don't mind not having steel complete. Like, it's a steel tip, but it's an aluminum barrel. Um, I know Haynes is really talking that one up a lot. Old Cameron Haynes. I think he shot um, that through his bear this spring. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. I think so. It shows yeah. in the video. I just watched it. It was a good video. But I think it was a carnivore. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sure I haven't watched that video yet. You should. I know. I'm. I'm I will. Cool. I will. It's fucking time, man. I know. <laughs> it's time. I mean, I was running around all day and like, oh, Tim's here. Let's go pod. It's time. And then, now, uh, do you soon, check your clock watch during the day, or you just? I ha yeah, because it's got alerts on it. Oh, okay. So I leave my phone in yeah. my pocket and we go, oh crap, I got to look at that. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm usually relatively conscious of roughly what time it is, but sometimes it gets away from me and it's to have on the radar. Yeah, and, we we're talking about that carnivore, right? Yeah, the carnivore that we think Cam shot through his bear. Um, <laughs> the micro hybrid is real interesting. That's a neat little head. Is um, that the one I shot through my bear? Yeah, it's fixed blade, yep. mechanical blade. Yeah, yeah, that's a neat head. Shot through that. I think that would be good. Um, you know, I worry about that actually flying well at distance. It's got a lot of planing surface. Sure, it's two. kind of a unique looking thing. I, I I'm probably gonna have like two broadheads in my quiver. Mm -hmm. Like maybe that little micro Hades that'll fly like a dart. It sure does. You it know, because really if I'm at 80 yards, I want something that flies like a dart. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a there's a couple of those like. Two blade, four blade, mechanical, one fixed, one mechanical. Yeah. Um, the assailant from uh, Slick Trick is a neat little, and it's steel. It's fully steel, smaller fixed blade, mechanical blade. I think it's inch and three quarter or something like that for a bigger cut. That broadhead always looked really good to me. It's I think it's been out two years. Um, if you know fixed blades from them too, they make a whole bunch, but they do make a three blade, uh, one piece machined steel, which is pretty cool. Mm hmm. Um, who else out there? VPA is solid. VPA is solid, but it's all one piece machine steel stuff. Yeah, you know, you're not uh, you're not doing a mechanical over there. Um, you know, honestly, Rage is popular for a reason. I mean, they they are good heads. Uh, the tripan is really hard to beat if you want to put a good hole in something. It's a titanium ferro with a two inch rear deploy. Uh, there's always Sever, but direct to consumer. Um, they uh, they make a really relatively good product. I've had uh, mostly good reports from that, although there's only so many people I can talk to about it just because there's not as many of them running around the world. It's a smaller usage product. Um, the thorns are really interesting, but your 
going into an aluminum broadhead again. You know, you're not doing steel. It's hard to find steel mechanicals. There's not that many. The assailant steel, the fatal steel from Grim Reaper steel, um, the titanium, um, sorry, rage, um, the titanium sever. Those are all hard metals. Um, and outside of that, uh, drawing a blank on more, honestly. There's, there's so few. Most of them are still making aluminum or using aluminum in it, and that's just it makes me all itchy. I don't like it. Yeah, I want and this hard is, metals. God, it's such a, you know, it's a it's a one in a five, six, seven year experience. So mm-hmm. I don't really want to test or tinker with anything. I well, just want trusted stuff. I know what it's going to be in. Why are you shooting a mechanical? Yeah. Why? Why in your head are you shooting a mechanical? For a blood trail. Okay, and you don't think that the Micro Hades Pro will give you a good blood trail? I think it'll give me a good blood trail. I think the mm-hmm. mechanicals will give you a little wide and cutting diameter. At the end of the day, and like I said, the, I was listening to that thing that Bomar said, and he had a really good point. Your recovery rate's higher on a mechanical broadhead. It just is because it's cutting a bigger hole. And I don't disagree with that. I really don't. Um, but in that scenario, I'd almost, I I really like that fatal steel broadhead. I've had nothing but really good experiences with it. I still question whether or not you should shoot an elk with stuff like that. I know a lot of people do. Um, I just know you're not going to penetrate as much. Uh, but if you're not worried about penetration, which on mule deer, black bear, white tail, black tail, I, I wouldn't be worried about penetration. As an adult male shooting a well-tuned bow at near 70 pounds, I don't think you should have anything to worry about. I watched multiple animals get shot with a fatal steel last year that did a phenomenal job. I I shot a couple. Brandon shot one. I shot that buffalo with it. Had no problems yeah, that's with penetration. Right. What, did, uh, with what, what, else did, what else did you shoot with it? Did you shoot your mule deer uh, with it? Last year, yep. I shot I shot everything with a fatal steel Tell last year. Tell me where you hit your mule deer. Uh, well, I shot him twice. I hit him just a tiny bit low um, behind the shoulder. On the first a, shot? On the first shot and got a full pass through. Uh, well, I, I, I lied. I shot him three times. Second time, um, he, he he just barely went off a little ways and bedded down. It was really cold. It was like zero out. Uh, and I shot him, and then we circled back around and went up above him and just glassed him and watched him, just waiting for him to die because, like, his head was up and his wobbly and, like, doing this stuff, right? Like, like he felt oh, like he like, could tip over. Oh, like he, well, he was bedded down. Yeah. Like, he wasn't standing. He'd, like, get up and... Like every five or ten minutes, he'd get up and take three steps and sit back. Did down. he do the hunch thing where he's all yeah. hunched up? Oh yeah, yeah. He did everything that would indicate that he was going to die. So we sat there and watched him for a while, just because we didn't want to spook him. And after a while, I gave up. It's like he's not dying. Like I, so we uh, we glassed and I went back around underneath him and snuck up right to him, like from me to the wall, damn near, like really close. Um, thinking that he was so weak, like I, I got within like the last ten feet that I wanted to cover, and the smart me should have just waited for him to stand up again because he, he was standing up like every 10 minutes, repositioning himself and sitting back down. And I went, this this thing's so weak, he's going to stand up and trip. Like he doesn't have the strength to run. So I just went, screw it, and I drew back my bow and started walking towards him, and he saw me and jumped and flew down the hill like so fast, and it was a relatively steep hill, so I went, shit, let my bow down, Went down to a flat spot, ranged him, and there was, like, nothing between me and him anymore. Like, he went to the next pile of brush and, bed, and like, fell down. Like, not stopped and bedded down, just fell down, didn't get back up. And it was 80, it's like 85 or 90 yards or something like that. But I had really good clean range, flat to stand on, no wind, nothing in between it. And I went, I'm going to shoot him right here. I'm not gonna. I, I take one step down that hill. He's probably gonna try to get up and move, and I'm pegged. There's nowhere I can't get any closer to him from where I'm at. So I'm like, screw it. Got flat. I took like two layers off, set him on the ground, ranged him twice, set my range finder down, just everything I can do to make a great shot, and uh, put the pin where I wanted it to go and hit exactly where I pointed. But I didn't think about the fact that his leg was back like that. And I actually did hit his shoulder. He was bedded. He was bedded and pushed back a hard, lot harder than I thought. That's one of the risks with that bedded and shot. I, and yeah. I, so I hit the shoulder, and he got up and went about another 20 yards and went back down. He, like, would just over a hill. Couldn't see him. Snuck back down to him and shot him again, and he took, like, two steps and fell over and was done. But um, but so I ended up shooting him three times. But um, 
I got great penetration every time. I, I the shoulder didn't penetrate really well, and I bent the broadhead. The broadhead went like that. So that was my only negative experience with that broadhead. But I mean, I shot him in the shoulder. That's my fault. That's not that broadhead's fault. And he was quartering a little towards me, and I thought he was more broadside. So I thought I was clearing the shoulder yeah. where I was pointing. Uh, once again, the three D targets were getting me to point where I shouldn't have pointed because that's the, that's what it does. Like you, you're not paying attention as much to the angle. And where the vitals are internally, you're thinking of the dot on the side of the animal of where you're training yourself to shoot, which is why I don't like the rings. But anyway, in any event, I, I, I thought that broadhead was great. I got a clean pass through all my buffalo. I uh, passed through all my antelope. I yeah, your buffalo shot a or bison or whatever it is. That's yeah. a pretty sick little. It's a pretty sick little case study there. Like yeah, I mean because those are thick. They are, and it was yeah. it was you know winter time. You know, so the the hide's thick too. Yeah, hide's thick. Mm -hmm. It's a big, thick animal. Like it is thicker than a moose, right? I think so. I think uh, per age they are. Um, and what else? I shot a I shot a whitetail in Washington. Clean pass through. That was probably just smoke through, right? Smoke through. Yeah, I was didn't even slow down. I shot a bear. Smoke through. I think it took four steps and was dead. Um, and I want to say my buddy Nick also shot those broadheads, and he shot two bears. And a deer, and nothing went more than twenty yards after he shot it. Um, yeah, I just that, that broadhead's good, and it, it meets my criteria. I don't want a giant cutting diameter because a giant cutting diameter really absorbs your penetration power. It really does. You just, and I still got really good holes and really great blood trails. Um, Brandon shot um, his antelope, and he shot it frontal, and it like put a hole in it like that. It's like, what the hell happened here? I mean, it was freaky. Um, that frontal is brutal. He was the other. He was the other person with me shooting those. And his his antelope like bled like a massacre. Uh, and he shot a he shot a white tail with him too. Uh, and he shot his uh, bighorn with him. And all of them were really quick recoveries, great shots. You know, good blood trails. No horror Did stories. Did he bow hunt his bighorn? Yes. Yeah, that's rad. Yeah. Yeah. He. And uh, you were there for part of that hunt? <clears throat> no, I was not there. We were. He was scouting a ton. We were. We he, we were just there for antelope, and then we hunted mule deer later, and he'd already shot his bighorn. So, uh, and his dad lives down that area, so he, um, they were, Pappy was glassing every day. Like he had, he had bighorns located, in. and he, he had was, in. was trying to pick one to shoot. You know, yeah, like and being picky about it, and he shot a really nice bighorn. It's a once in a lifetime deal. It is. That's right. why I was being really picky about it, and he take, took a lot take of time it seriously. He took a lot of time for yeah. it, and was very successful. Not a lot of people will shoot a bighorn ram with a bow and arrow in their life. No. Much less a trophy ram. Do you know how close did he get? Do you know? Uh, I thought I thought he was like 40, 45 yards. It wasn't super far. Yeah. I'll have to ask him again, but I'm pretty sure it was. It was right in there. Yeah, neat, uh, neat experience, and I may have to start putting in for that, especially because Idaho is... Uh, not a point state, right? So everyone's got the same chance. Yeah. Whereas if you've been, if you haven't been doing the point system, you're kind of fucked at this point. Yeah. Like you're, you're so far behind everybody else that you're never getting drawn. Or if you're trying to draw a decent tag anywhere, it's going to take you ten to twenty years to draw. The, well, the I, challenge is you got to front the cash, yeah. uh, and that's what keeps some people from doing it. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I get that. Uh, fronting the money is not easy. That's part of the deal. But you know, if you're if you're going to go on like elaborate hunts and things like that, you've got the cash to front. So, and once you budget for it, and it's just part of your yearly annual budget, mm -hmm. you know, once you get past the first year, it's normal. It's not that big a deal. So it's all it's all what you're willing to spend your money on and what's important to you. If yeah. it's if it's a priority, make it a priority. And you know, services like uh, Hunting Fool or whatnot, like Jared C CEOs really make that a lot simpler. They really help you. So if you're trying to do that, I would really encourage that personally. Yeah, I signed up for Hunt and Fool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a no-brainer. Yeah. It really is. It's very simple. They they simplify it. They dumb it down for you, help you decide what you're doing and they where you're doing it. a lot of value, it. yeah. A ton of value for not that much money. To me, one of the greatest values is in the previous Hunt member list. Yeah, that's huge. So if you draw um, uh, a hard hunt from them they'll put you in touch with every other person that's a member yeah, of them i just did it you got I a request it. yeah but basically 
the other people that do the same, you're all entered into a, a pool where your name goes on a list. And if someone in the future draws it, you know, so it's like a mutual respect kind of thing. Like, hey, I've been here. Mm-hmm. And most people, if you're doing a hunt once every three, five, seven, ten years, which is new to me, but most people are so willing to share yeah. information because it's not an over-the-counter deal. No, the, 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 law, the, the odds of you going back to the exact same spot and hunting yeah. the exact same animals and having the exact same results are pretty low. And it's not going to be next year, right? So no, it'll be when so somebody calls now. you up and they want information, it's like, yeah, have it all. Yeah. And it's it's unique to me, but that's kind of like the culture's like in like Arizona, uh, Arizona, Nevada, some of New Mexico, where like party hunting is a lot more popular because they might draw a tag once every three, five, seven years. Right. So when they do draw a tag, it's like them and all their friends go do it and they help yeah. s- scout and they're yep. part of the program. Like I've gotten half a dozen uh, messages on Instagram like, hey, I could, I'm in Nevada, you know, you know they were asking where my tag was and offering to help scout because that's like a kind of a part of their culture. Like it's a more of a community driven hunt, which is kind of interesting. New, it's new to me anyway. Yeah, for sure. And I, when my uh, cousin drew that rifle tag, we went down and helped, Yeah, you know, and just, we can't shoot anything. It's but, kind of cool you know. to be a participant on a hunt. It is. It's fun. Yeah. It's, di- it's a different thing when you know, it's not your tag. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like you have the same drive, but without the stress. <laughs> yes, without the stress. Without the stress, it's pretty cool. It was it was a good time. I would definitely do it again. Yeah, yeah. and like when Jared was on the podcast talking about having all the people around him supporting him on that hunt, like, dude, that's a, it depends how everyone handles it, but that's extra pressure, right? Like, you've got extra yeah, you people feel, handling. Feeling yeah, more of a need to perform. A little more obligation or whatever. I don't know, once in a lifetime tag, you're probably feeling pressure probably enough, and obligation yeah. regardless. Yeah. Because you don't want to waste that opportunity. But, yeah, it's kind of unique or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's amazing how so much of hunting is not about shooting the animal. No. It's really not. It's I mean, not. granted, we all want to be sustained by healthy means, and that's really what it boils down to, but it's not about that at all. It's about being there. It's about experiencing it. And it's about the camaraderie with your with your cohorts and whatnot is really the biggest part of it. Yeah, you get to see wild places, wild spaces, and mm-hmm. shared experiences, and, and these, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot more to hunting than... It's a lot more than anybody thinks that doesn't do it, that's for sure. Yeah. It would surprise you, just like it surprises most people that have never done it, and for some reason or another get an interest in it, and they're like, wow, this is not what I thought at all. There's yeah. A, there's a connection. And there's a lot less action. Than people would oh, yeah. expect. I guess a lot of not success at all for and a lot <laughs> of downtime portion. and shit. You know, like yeah, waiting. Yeah, a lot of there's waiting. Some, there's been some world record naps taken on a mountainside. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, some this of the is world's true. best. This is true, and some yeah. of the you know some of the greatest thoughts you'll ever have will come to you in those times. Too. Oh, dude, I right? think I think it's a necess- a necessity for that kind of thing. Yeah, I've had some of my best ideas, and I've made some of my biggest decisions. Uh, out doing that kind of stuff where it just gives me time to think about it and process my thoughts. And it's like, oh, okay, this this seems like the right thing to do. Um, right. I remember when I was ready to break off and do my own thing, I, I made that decision while I was on a hunt. I was like, no, I need to I need to do this uh, when, I, when I started my golf business on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, that came on a hunt and... It was just a really big decision. It's a big pivot in your life. And yeah, it was it just time out there gave me the opportunity to really sort through my thoughts and you know, decide what was important to me. And um yeah, and then I do have some of my best ideas out there too. Yeah. You know, and you hear actually you hear about other people doing this kind of stuff in the business world, uh, on like some business podcasts I listen to, but they'll be they'll call it something different. They'll be like, Yeah, I take a week and I go live in a cabin for a week in the woods. It's like that's kind of actually what hunting is in a mm-hmm. way. It's mm-hmm. just uh, relabeling it a little bit. Um, have you ever heard about the four pillars of happiness? I want to say I've heard that before, but I couldn't tell you what Yeah, I would have to look it up to know what all four of them are off the top of my head. But one of them is time in nature. Well, sure. 100%. You can't recharge your batteries if you're not plugging into the wall, you know. You yeah, gotta, let me do my you young Jamie thing here and let me look up the yeah, four you pillars can look of it happiness up for, for a sure. second. No, being in nature is... Just such an amazing change, you know. You got you. You just perceive things differently. 
It's great. Even when it's freaking really hot and brutal, it's still a very positive thing. How are we doing, Jimmy? Yeah. Go for it. I need one second. Definitely not the the world's fastest Googler, apparently. (laughs) Yeah. Here we go. Jeopardy music. Loving and engaged relationships, a sense of purpose, uh, time in nature. And this one sounds different. This one says an attitude of optimism. I don't, uh, that doesn't sound like the one I originally heard. Anyway, time in nature, it's freaking important. It is. It's one of four. Yeah. And if there's only four, that's kind of a big deal. I think so. Yeah. I think so. No, time in nature is everything. I find, like when I've been overrun or really, really busy, which is always, um, if I don't get to my property, at least I was going to say that's twice, what your time at the property is. It's right? really what it is. I mean, when I when I got it, I was like gung ho about trying to get all my stuff done and all these projects and real and build a place and whatnot. I'm like, no, I am half the time. If I'm up here for two days, the first half of the day can be work projects. The second half of the day is dicking off. And I'm just going to enjoy being up here and relax, take a breath, breathe it in, do some glass and go for razor rides or whatnot, explore, you know, but be out in nature and not just always go, 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 go. And it really recharges. When I go hunting up there, because it's all like ground blind tree stand hunting, not, you know, not running around, not chasing things. So it's morning and evening, quiet. So you've got so much downtime. And man, I, it's amazing the thoughts that come to me over that time. I think of so many really good things during that time or focus on direction. Or what am I doing and how am I doing it and how do I need to do it differently and whatnot. Love that. And one of the best things for me right after my dad died is I went hunting for four days. And boy, it was hard to sit quietly because I kept crying because you get left with your thoughts and Nothing to distract you? Oh, boy. You're going to be faced with reality, and it's a really good thing to face your reality. It's kind of crazy that it. um, when you're left with nothing but your thoughts, the stuff you'll sort through. Yeah. You hear people talk about that, that solo hunt. They're like, you need to kind of have your ducks in a row to be out there for five, seven, ten days by yourself. Mm-hmm. Or you just need to be a little crazy, and I think often that's a little bit of both. But um, bit of both. It does give you time to sort through your thoughts in a way that's very different. Yep. You know, in a more focused way. Just because there's nothing dude. to distract you from it. It's just different. I think about you know my New Mexico elk hunt, and uh, or th- something I'll always remember is on my final load out, I was packing my elk out and I'm just like listening to bulls bugling. I'm like within an earshot of the, uh, one of the major hiking trails in the U S I'm at like 10,000 feet or something crazy. And I was like, this is freaking spiritual. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know. It's hard to describe. One might think it puts you in tune with the way man was intended to be instead of what we are. That we're uh, subservient to the land and that we are nurtured and provided for by the land, by our own skill and ability. And when you're providing for yourself in that manner, it's a mesmerizing experience and there's no other real way to put it. It's crazy, dude. It is. Yeah, I will will always have that as a very distinct memory. And then in the background, I've got bulls bugling and stuff. It was just like... It's cool. It was wild. Yeah, well, there's something that triggers in your brain when when you... kill something that you're eating and it's very primal it's like i'm gonna survive and that doesn't go away even though it's pretty easy to survive anymore in comparison but that's still there no different than the excitement of when you catch a fish that is from your subconscious going i'm gonna survive and it's why every kid is happy when they catch a fish that's right and they don't want to release it yeah it's because that's in your subconscious that is substance of survival from the land that is where we're supposed to be getting our stuff from and how we're supposed to be functioning. Unfortunately, we don't live that way anymore. Yeah. And the thing that like, will bring that back for me 
is just going to the freezer. Like you go to the freezer, yep. you grab an elk steak that's like, oh, elk steak labeled New Mexico. It's like, holy shit. I, and it brings you through to that full circle thing where it's like, I worked for that. I hunted for that. I packed it out. I butchered it. And it's a, it's a relationship to your food that I think few will ever understand or appreciate unless they've been some type of part of that process. I agree. It's just so different, dude. It's so different than going to the store and picking out a pound of burger. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? When you know where it comes from and you know how you got it, it's a different deal. And the sweat equity involved. I, I could imagine it might yeah. be moderately similar to raising an animal to butcher for your own. If you took care of, did all the work, all that, you know, you probably feel a similar result, but still not the same. I mean, because there's a... Yeah, when you raise an animal to butcher it, it's got a 100% chance it's going to die and end up in your freezer. And when you're out hunting, that does there's no guarantees at all. There's no guarantees. There's yeah. not. There's not. I mean, there's there's higher odds and higher likelihoods, but there's no guarantees. Yeah. Just a different thing. Yeah. Get out. Spend some time out there. Absolutely. Scouting, hunting, Time with your friends. Take some, take a friend or two with you, and experience that time together and that camaraderie. Yeah. And share that experience with other people. It's just, it's, it'll change your life if you haven't done it. It'll really change your life. It'll make you realize. I mean, so many people don't understand why those that week or two every year is so important to you, and it's everything. Yeah. To those of you that understand it and get it, and you can't explain it to somebody who hasn't done it. Yeah. And invite invite a non hunter hunting. Yeah, absolutely. Trick them into it. Tell them it's a camping yeah. trip. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't because that's kind of what it is. It is in a it's, way. It, a lot of it's camping, but yeah, yeah I wouldn't trick them. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> no, not trick them go into well. it. Just trick them into it. Yeah. yeah. No, there you go. but no, really invite them out, have them be a part of the process. It's mostly camping. With you know, if it goes well, it's one percent of the time is spent shooting. Right. It's hiking and camping. It's hiking well, and bow hiking, what, baby. Yeah, that's what people. I've done. A, I've done. A, I'm a pretty. I'm a better bow hiker than I am hunter. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might resemble that remark. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, uh, guys, Josh is going to attack tomorrow. Let's wrap that pod. We do, what? Wrap it up? Let's be safe. Let's wrap it up. Wrap it up. I'm going to go try to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Go to bed early and see if I can fall asleep. All right, I got to get up really early. We will catch you back for the next one. Peace.